Hi, welcome to MIG Monday. I'm Paul. Today I want to talk about gas flow, you know, things that can interrupt gas flow, what happens when you run out of gas uh, or don't have enough gas to cover the weld. As we know, the gas shields the weld molten pool from the atmosphere, which, is, which can, with the oxygen in the atmosphere, can uh, cause a lot of porosity and, and difficulties. So I'm going to make some weld here on this, on this piece of metal. Uh, while I'm welding, I'm going to have somebody come and shut my gas bottle off partway through the weld so we can see what happens when the gas flow is disrupted, okay? Um, I'm going to clamp right to the piece. This is actually a pretty good thing to do, is clamp your, your uh, ground right to the piece that you're working on. I have a metal table here, and it's, some people just put a ground clamp and almost like a permanent installation right on their metal table. That doesn't necessarily mean you're going to get a good ground because you can get dust and grit and everything, so it doesn't, I mean, even if, as I slide this, you can almost hear the kind of gritty feel that, or the, hear the feel, hear the gritty sound that it makes when I slide this uh, because there are things, contaminants between this piece and the table. So it's always best whenever possible to clamp your, your ground right on the work that you're welding on. Okay, and then of course you still always want a clean weld, so or a clean surface to weld on. So I'm gonna, you know, there might be oil or something on this place, so I'm just gonna use a little easy wipe on here, which will remove any oil or contamination that might be on the plate. And then we'll get ready to weld. You can see what, you, know, you, can, you can kind of see what that removed off of there that wasn't even very, very apparent when we uh, were looking at it earlier. All right, so I'm gonna start to weld. And then, like I said, partway through the weld, my associate's going to shut down the gas bottle, and we'll see what happens with the, uh, with the weld at that point. Well, I guess you could really t <laughs> tell the difference when that gas cut off. I mean, you could just hear by the sound that uh, something went drastically wrong. And you can even tell really not even much need to wire brush that. You can, you can see over here where I had gas, everything looked pretty good. And as soon as that gas went away, boy, it was just Swiss cheese. So. Uh, Always watch that gas flow. Now there's other things that can influence this as well, and that's air movement. Maybe you don't run out of gas, maybe you're in an environment where there's wind or draft, you're welding outside, you gotta watch out for welding outside on windy days because uh, that can just basically do the same thing as if you ran out of gas. Or even if you're indoors with a fan, or somebody opens a door and suddenly creates a cross breeze. Uh, numerous things can disrupt your gas flow. We'll try and we'll show you what happens with a little bit of excess wind uh, with the next weld, all right? Okay, now what we're gonna demonstrate is how wind can affect a welding gas shield. Uh, what I have set up over here is a fan. Now obviously nobody would, in their right mind would set up a fan to blow right on their work like that. But this is just a simulation and what it tries to represent is that Sometimes wind comes up when you're not expecting it. Uh, and it can be a substantial amount of wind, a cross draft when somebody opens a door after you've been welding already. Uh, or even if you're welding outside and it seems like a relatively calm, gentle day, we've all been outside and had a sudden gust of wind come along. So uh, if you're in an environment where wind movement or air movement can be an issue, uh, the best thing to do is set up wind screens between you and whatever that wind source would be so that if it does happen, it's not gonna affect your weld. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start to weld here and then my friend is going to uh, plug in the uh, fan so we can start getting some, some pretty significant air movement. And we should see uh, a, a pretty good deterioration of the weld as I go along. Okay, well let's give this a shot. Boy, did you hear how did you hear how harsh that got very suddenly? And you could just look at the look at the weld itself, just how how badly that turned out. Here I've got my gas shield and everything's fine. The fan got turned on here, and you can see just the change in the bead shape. 
uh, a little porosity. Uh, it's just uh, you know a real uh, real significant change from what you would expect as an ordinary weld. So that kind of wraps it up, and hopefully this illustration pointed out the importance of the shielding gas. Uh, whether you run out of gas because your bottle goes empty, or you're experiencing some wind movement that suddenly removes your gas shielding, uh, hopefully now you can see how important that is to maintain that shield. Uh, the atmosphere will attack the molten puddle, and you're going to get porosity and a very poor quality weld. There's a couple of things also to bear in mind besides air movement that can uh, cause a problem. We already mentioned running out of gas when I had my friend shut the gas off during my weld. One of the things I didn't mention was flow rate. Typically for MIG welding, you want to be somewhere between 20 CFH and 30. Uh, too much creates the same kind of turbulence. If you picture turbulence kind of a thing like this where the gas is going down, hitting a plate and scooping back up, it can actually draw air right into the molten puddle and, and cause a problem because you've now introduced air. Uh, if you don't have enough, then you're even more susceptible to air movement and having the shielding gas blown away. Uh, and I've, you know, I hate to kind of tell tales on myself, but when I was setting this machine up, uh, I was having a lot of trouble making decent welds. I couldn't figure out why am I not getting good welds? Why am I having porosity? Uh, I, I thought I set everything up correctly, but after tracing everything down, I found what I had neglected to do, or what I thought I did, and it wasn't actually seated correctly, was the introduction of the gun. You know, the gas comes through the machine and is introduced into the end of the gun, and then the gas flow comes down the cable to the, to the gas gun. I did not have the gas gun pushed up far enough to make a connection from the gas flow from the machine into the gun. And so, therefore, when I was welding, I had very little, if any, gas and you know, I've, I spent <laughs> almost a sleepless night trying to figure out what the heck is wrong here. I checked everything, and it turned out it was something as simple as not having the gun seated in there well enough. So that's also something to kind of keep in mind when you're setting up, make sure everything is exactly the way it's supposed to go, and, and you should have plenty of successful wells down the road. All right? Well, that's it for MIG Monday, and we'll see you next time.